to experience action like you've never heard it before. Action sports, celebrities, badasses, and massive interviews. All coming to you from the Polaris Razor Studio. This is Jim Beaver's Project Action, exclusively on Podcast One. Welcome to Project Action on Podcast One, coming at you from the Polaris Razor Studio. Jim Beaver here with, uh, man, we got a fun one today. My good friend Rutledge Wood, you know him from, uh, that's a TV personality, Top Gear, NASCAR, just uh, recently got done wrapping up a show on Netflix that is insane called Hyperdrive. Uh, This is an interview, uh, we actually did uh, 400 episodes of the Down and Dirty Radio Show. I kind of had to abbreviate this one, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to air this thing uncut right here on Project Action. Insane interview we did about a month and a half half back so uh, i think you guys are going to enjoy this one um rutledge man this guy eats sleeps breathes cars and car culture and uh, i gotta tell you it does not disappoint uh, anything rutledge wood doesn't disappoint that's just uh that's just facts uh anyways uh, yeah rutledge wood on the show this week really really excited about that uh make sure and go over if you haven't already hit that subscribe button on itunes uh make sure and subscribe to the show and uh, leave a rating review definitely helps us out um if you haven't already please do that and you can give me a follow at jim beaver 15 on all forms of social media and you know what uh before we get into this Rutledge Wood interview, I'm actually heading out to SEMA next week, so I'm going to keep this one short, keep the intro short. We are going to cut right to the meat of things. But I want to tell you about uh, a couple of our awesome, awesome partners here in Project Action. One of those are good friends at betonline.ag. And you know what? Right now we've got something called the uh, Sportsnet Challenge going on where all of us hosts here on the Podcast One Sportsnet, you can check them out at podcastonesportsnet.com. Uh, we got a uh, pick em game going on where each week I pick five of my top five picks in the NFL, one lock that I think are going to win games and uh, we all compete head to head and uh, right now I am right at the top of the heap I've been doing some uh, some killer picks and uh, you know what we're also doing is is each week five listeners to the show if I beat all the other hosts I'm giving away 500 bucks 100 bucks each to all you listeners that is right Uh, so uh, you want to be following me on social media at Jim Beaver 15 because when I win you win as well Uh, join the conversation at hashtag sports net challenge you know NFL college football you know World Series just wrapped up it's all heating up this week with games that you're not going to want to miss out on though and our good friends and exclusive partner podcast one uh, betonline.ag you can take advantage of the best bonuses in the business sign up for a free account make sure and use the promo code podcast one and get a 50 percent sign up bonus you know week eight nfl matchups san fran at az that was Halloween night. Minnesota, Kansas City, Detroit, Oakland, Green Bay ch- at the Chargers, and New England at Pittsburgh. College football, yeah, it's week nine there. Utah, Washington, Georgia, Florida, Virginia Tech at Notre Dame, Oregon at USC, and Miami at Florida State. World Series, it's Washington versus Houston. Yeah, that wrapped up. Hopefully you guys made some money on that one. Visit betonline.ag. Don't forget, use that promo code PODCAST1 for a 50% sign-up bonus. Betonline.ag, your online sports book experts. And you know everybody's got a to-do list. Drop off the dry cleaning, pick up some milk, pay some bills. Here's an idea. Let's add save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. And the good thing is you don't have to drop off or pick up anything. All you have to do is go to geico.com and in 15 minutes you, yeah, you listening right now, could be saving 15% or more on car insurance. Extra money in your pocket just may be the most rewarding thing that you do today. And with that, I'm going to roll into this interview with Rutledge Wood. I'd like to welcome my buddy Rutledge Wood to the show, and it only took us 400 episodes to get you here, buddy. <laughs> well, you know, I was just really waiting. I, I just knew this is a milestone, and so I was really trying to just buy my time and just make sure that I really made it. So, uh, dude, congrats first off. And uh, it's so cool that what you do makes such a difference. And uh, I've had so many friends on here. And I've always wanted to do it. We finally found the time, so thank you for having me. Yeah, just it, you and I have been pinging each other back and forth for a good month now, and I'm like, uh, you've got a lot, lot going on, man. Um, I, it's been actually a pretty big month for you, but I know I just looking. You were at Indy, and it, it's funny because I just was watching your social media today, and something popped up, and I'm like, I've been to Indianapolis Motor Speedway uh, quite a few times. I, you know, I can't say countless times, but quite a few. I can tell you, dude, it is never. I've never had like even the inkling that I needed to go to the golf course, but yet you went and saw that. Then I'm like, how, how have I been to, how have I been to Indianapolis motor speedway and never actually been to the golf course? You know, it's like, I think it's one of those, oh. most of us that go there. Just, it, it doesn't cross our mind. Right. But you went out there, you and Dale jr. Look like you guys had a lot of fun. 
We did. You know, it's funny. I actually got to go to my first Indy 500. I've been to the Brickyard. I bet, I bet, fifteen times. I might have missed one in, in all these years. I've been covering NASCAR, but this was my very first year to go to the Indy 500, and I got to cover it for NBC with my buddy Dale Earnhardt Jr. and I told him about this kind of legend that I had chased down the year before. So, you know, they call it the Brickyard because at one time it was paved with 3.2 million bricks when they started that place. And I think the year was 1911 when they actually put the bricks down because it started before that. But at some point they started realizing they were wearing a little bit funny and they needed to change it. So they started pulling sections up and then a little more, a little more, paved the whole thing. Well, they had all these bricks and they weren't sure what to do with them. So some of them they went and used in other buildings and other shorings up, but they took a ton of them and they essentially lined the, the, the creek walls of this creek that ran through the golf course that was next door. And there's four holes uh, inside. And so sure enough, Dale and I went and waited around and he didn't believe me. It took like an hour to find one that he really liked, but uh, it's something that people have done over the years. And it's such a funny experience because, you know, we've been in a lot of weird places in our lives for for work and or pleasure. But when you're in a creek that looks a lot like a sewer, uh, <laughs> it's tough to convince someone that you should have A, B in there. And there's like old beer bottles and stuff. We're all just barefoot with our jeans rolled up. But, you know, sometimes you find that one thing and suddenly you're like, okay, this was an amazing trip. I did have a great time. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned that about be, us being funny places and stuff like that. And I, I had this conversation a couple of weeks ago with somebody and, you know, the thing about motorsport and just car culture in general that I'm very fortunate about, you're very fortunate about, and all of our friends are, is like, I've been able to travel the country and, you know, and I, I've seen places in this country that most people won't ever get to see. And I mean, I've been to towns and cities and, and backwoods and things that most people that are going to take a vacation, they never go where we get to go. But it's like car culture, like if there's an event or there's a cool road or it, like it doesn't matter, like we'll, we'll hold an event there and people will come. And I think that's one thing that's rad is, is I think you and I both have had these awesome experiences in places that honestly, if I wasn't involved in racing or car culture, I probably never would have been to, you know? Oh, completely. I mean, you think about, and I know you and uh, and we have a great mutual friend in Tanner Faust, yeah. and you know, all the years that we did Top Gear, I mean, we got to go to some insane corners of of the world. Whether it's running a, a logging truck, which you and I both know, there's no way they should have let us do that, <laughs> um, or watching Tanner go rally around at some place in Vermont. We went to all these cool places that you really just don't you don't get that chance to do it. I think that's what makes motorsports in this country so unique because we really do find these corners and these places of, of, of the country and ultimately the world where we want to go and we see and experience it. Um, I think, I feel like you did, were a part of that race that Tanner was telling me that kind of goes from somewhere in California to Vegas and you guys all just haul ass in your Polaris the whole time. Like those are the things that I think, man, I wish I had a weekend off so I could go, do a different kind of motorsport, but I think that's what I think this industry does so well is that whether it's on the street or, you know, off road in the dirt, there's so many different things for people who love motorsport to go watch or to go participate. We're really, really fortunate like that. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, motorsport and cars in general, it's, it's really cool that, it's one of those few things that people from all walks of life, it's a, it's one of those unifying things. And I say every, you know, every two years, I should say the Olympics are that way where everybody, everybody can come together as one in the United States. You know what I mean? And, and it's, we're rooting for one team, one common thing, you know, and there's very few things I think left in the world that are, that are that unifying force, but I feel like cars are that way and racing is that way. Like I can go overseas. I can go to Mexico. It doesn't matter where I go. It, car people are car people. And we all come together. And like, when you see something, cool it's you know it's just weird because it's like all kinds of political bound everything goes away when you're talking about racing or cars it's just like it doesn't exist you know it's like we're just all car people and i think that's one thing that's really special about motorsport and and the car you know and auto industry and and you know in car culture is that it is that unifying force or one of the few things i think left in the world that actually can do that to people it is, and it's funny because I end up a lot of times trying to defend. I feel like I end up defending being pro motorsports because in my mind, it's not just um, going to watch NASCAR or you know watching a trophy truck go off jump. It's it's everything that has to do with cars, trucks, and bikes, and anything with wheels to me. And it's funny, like 
you know, I've found myself lately in defense of this new show I did, Hyperdrive, because there's a lot of people who think, oh, it's what's gimmicky and it's this and the other. It's like, well, number one, yeah, we made a show for the masses, right? We made a show that's like Top Gear meets Ninja Warrior. Yeah. And the people that are super gearheads, their biggest criticism is like, well, there's not enough info about the cars and I don't care about their backstory. I just want to see it. And all I really feel like saying is, well, then you should turn on a race some weekend of any series and go watch it because – when we have a show and a, and a group like Netflix that will put the money behind a show like this, if they did, to me, if you're into off-road stuff, this is still a show you should watch. In the same way that, like, I sit down and watch every truck night in America, and I watch half of these build shows that you and I know are completely fake because I think it's important that we all support the greater good of, of, of what this industry looks like. So it's funny how sometimes people get – like, we can all be like, yay, cars, but then someone sees a guy at a Corvette pull up, and he's like, oh, is he wearing a gold chain? Like, is it an old guy? And you're like, no, not everybody that drives a Corvette is old and wears a gold chain. Is that a stereotype? Yes, and sometimes it's right. But I sometimes think we get lost in this minutia of of trying to think that we're better than other people in this industry. And it's weird because, you know, I don't know what got you started, but for me – it was my dad being into cars and we started wrenching on anything we could. And so like when the import craze kind of took off, the reason it really took off and it was our generation's hot rods is just like my dad and the one he messed with, we could afford the cars that we bought and we could afford yeah. to work on them and make them better. And so now when I see people be critical of, especially younger kids, like it's harder for people, for kids to get into cars nowadays. Number one, there's not as many I think kind of cool choices, not as much stuff swaps over. There's a million things you could say to, besides like technology and they don't go hang out in front of each other anymore. <laughs> but, you know, it's like I see somebody making fun of a kid because, oh, he did something stupid to his car. And I just have to stop people and be like, dude, that was you eight years ago or 10 years ago or 15. We all have to start somewhere. But like when you see a low rider who can talk to a guy with a hot rod, who can also talk to a guy with a new Toyota Supra, like that to me is that glue that holds us all together. But if we all liked the same thing, none of this stuff would be cool. The difference is to me is what makes it special. Yeah. Well, and I, I completely agree with you, you know, and it's, it's interesting when you start getting those conversations, you know, with the different types of people in the automotive industry, you know, we've got so many mutual friends. I mean, I've been on Corolla's show and I've been on Spike's Ferriston show and like, you know, we all have something different we, we bring to the table, but it's like, we can go and we can talk. And I love hearing, you know, like Spike's Porsche, you know, stories and, and I'm not a Porsche guy, yeah. but I, I can appreciate that, you know, and, and I know little enough that we can draw parallels and it's the same when I talk off-road trucks to him like he's never really been in one but he can appreciate it and he loves the stories you know and i i feel like you know like you said it, it's just interesting and it, you know like you said too i grew up in that generation and i know it was uh you know here in the southwest where i was at it was uh it was imports you know and, and the tuner craze and it was also um it was also guys were were building you know whether it be toyota pickups or rangers into pre-runners and things like that and just bouncing through right. you know the desert and i grew up there and i mean i i owned my first truck when i was only 14 and i was already saving up you know from washing cars and my weekend job to uh to buy fiberglass fenders and stuff and i, I didn't even have a driver's license and i was already <laughs> spending money on a truck you know but i grew up just like you did because i was in the shop with my dad and that's what you did you wrenched you know and you wrenched and you wrenched and it just gets its hooks in you at a young age and you know, you know, here we are. I'm, you know, I think same age as you within a few months. And, uh, you know, it's the rest is history, man. I've figured out how to uh, never grow up, I like to say. And who would have guessed that we would be in an era where, you know, guys like Matt Farah with Smoking Tire or uh, David, that dude in blue, Tavarish. All, if you look at how people are using, you know, the different mediums that we have, and even like guys like Doug DeMuro just absolutely abusing the CarMax return policies. Like there have been so many cool things that I think when you and I were first starting out, you go, man, I wish I understood better. Like what, what's this part really doing? Or I wish there was like some way I could figure out how to mod this one thing. Well, now there's this incredible resource in the internet where so many people who share the same passion are willing to to share this knowledge and even show you how, and it's even providing like a way of life for so many of these people that to me, I just think we've never been in a better place kind of big picture with, with the industry. And the fact that, I mean, think how many cars come off the block now with over 500 horsepower in the tightest, like 
fuel mileage standards we've ever had. You just sit there and laugh and go, I don't totally get what's happening, but I love that it is. Well, and it's funny you say that because I was looking back and I, I, I mean, my family's got a Ford dealership that's a hundred years old. So I, I've been a Ford guy and obviously I, I'm just a car guy. I've, you know, I've had contracts with Subaru and things like that, but I know like the, the earliest cars I can remember that I really, really want. I mean, we all have like the Lamborghini Countach posters on our wall in the eighties. Like that was sure. a given, but I remember Ford came out. I went to a, a Ford show in the early, I mean, I had to been 10, 11 years old, early nineties. And uh, Ford came out with an SVT Contour. And I remember I thought this Ford Contour SVT was the raddest car ever made. And if you look I up this. Too. I did too. I totally did too. It's like 190 horsepower. And I look at that. I'm like, one, how did Ford put out an SVT Contour that was 190 horsepower? And then I'm like, man, things have really, I mean, you can get a bone stock Fiesta or pick your whatever compact car has got that nowadays. Like, it's crazy, man. Who would have guessed that I, I've seen lately so many of the the focus, the Fiesta, um, like th- there's no way when we were growing up that anyone would have ever looked at a Ford Festiva and thought, man, one day <laughs> that thing's going to be cool. And then the remember the, the Shogun came out? Yeah. The Shogun was like taking a, a Ford Festiva and giving it a whole bunch of meth, and you came back and you're like, wow, you look pretty good. <laughs> like had the SHO V6 at the back wide body the car still makes no sense i saw one of cars caffeine and octane in atlanta and just immediately thought that i have to own this car i want to drive this car i'm sure it's a terrible driving car but damn it if it's not cool and someone did it i mean there was a time do you remember how cool the probe gt v6 was dude and it had the turbo on there and uh that was another dream car of mine i wanted a probe gt turbo with a stick like that was like the dream car now you look at probes Dude, that was the ugliest car. What were we thinking? Oh, my gosh. I have no idea. And you you don't find them anywhere. And if you do see one, you can't. I mean, you rubberneck so hard <laughs> to turn your head and think, like, what a time that was. When I was in high school, I had four or five friends at once that all had one. And they – it was, like, the goofiest non-car club car club ever. Like, they <laughs> thought they were a crime-fighting team. But, man, those were fun to drive. It's funny you bring this up because we probably got some listeners like, what the hell is a Ford Probe? Yeah, go and Google it because you're going to be like, oh, Jimmy and Rutledge are nuts. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Also, look up the MX-6 from Mazda. Same car underneath. Funny. Just, But then they they were little torque monsters, torque steer the whole time. I had one friend uh, named Rick who put a single chamber Flowmaster on there. It's oh. a record. It was so redneck. And it's, it's sort of like a redneck Ferrari. Like, it sounded cool. And terrible simultaneously, and we love that thing. That's funny because I had a single chamber Flowmaster, and uh, I put that on my Ranger with a 2.9 V6, and that thing wouldn't go and get out of its way when I had 31 inch tires on there, but it sounded loud, anyways. And my parents loved it because oh. my dad's like, I always knew when you came home late because we could hear you from six blocks away. Oh, for sure. Like, and I get that it's like a time of life, but there's a reason I'm a Magnaflow guy now. I could tell you that for sure. All my cars sound awesome. And none of them sound like hot garbage. That's for sure. <laughs> well, I think that, yeah, and I'm a Gibson guy, but uh, I think that muffler is still made out there somewhere. But uh, uh, that is, that's funny, man. But, you know, you mentioned hyperdrive, and I, I wanted to ask you about that because, you know, you kind of gave the primer on that show. And uh, I, I, to be honest with you, I've kind of started watching, but it's one of those I know I want to binge watch it. So I, I kind of just been dipping my toe in the water. But, you know, you, I think where we're at in the car car industry and motorsports in general, like I, you know, this show. I mean, we're we're eight years deep now, and we started at you know, quote unquote, action motorsports, and it was kind of you know, motorsports evolving now, which is funny because I've gone full circle and I'm covering IndyCar and NASCAR and NHRA and everything else, but. Do you, I, yeah. I kind of feel like Tanner and Ken Block, I mean, those are a couple of guys. I mean, you can throw Vaughn and Forsberg and Turk and those guys in there as well. But, you know, specifically Tanner and Ken, like they kind of created this whole movement where I, I think it, it really showed people, hey, we can do so much more in cars. I mean, with, with you know, everything that Tanner's done with the Hot Wheels stuff and, you know, Ken with Jim Connors and things like that. And I feel like this is kind of the culmination of where where we're at right now, you know, this whole thing with Hyperdrive. Completely. And I think, you know, what? I don't think we could have a show like this without um, what Ken Block has done, what Tanner Faust has done, because those guys up the bar so much. And they were a great influence on each other, even to to sort of say, like, all right, I'm going to try this. Well, I'm going to try this. And and that 
Um, for the automotive side, it's kind of like what Pastrana has done for bikes. You know, it's all yeah. these guys come together to try to make things uh, better. Because one person watched show and they're like, oh, it's like Jim Connor Grid. I was like, well, kind of, it's like Jim Connor Grid in that it's this insane all out competition, except. Some of the cars that are in Jim Connor Grid are the most expensive race cars that people have ever seen. So <laughs> it's a it's a variance. I think what's so cool about Hyperdrive is when when Aaron Catling and the, the guys who came up with the show, they wanted to find something that anyone in the world would watch and go, I want to try it. I got to do that. And to do that, you had to kind of tap into the mind of a kid. Like you know, you remember playing with Hot Wheels and you you'd zoom them around on your floor and it was like, oh, I'm going to do this jump or I would slide through here. It's essentially that same notion, but on this grand stage. And when the producers interviewed me two years ago about the show and said, does this sound fun? Like, is this something you're interested in? I said, I, I got to be honest, this sounds like my like perfect show. This is an absolute dream come true, but I don't think anyone's going to give you enough money to make it. And they said, excuse me. I was like, yeah, no, I just, I hope they do. If they do, please call me. But I think this is going to be impossible to do this right, and you've got to have a ton of money. And and luckily, Netflix loved the idea and backed it. And to see 28 drivers from all over the world, we had probably 15 or so from the U.S., maybe 14, to see all these drivers pack their car into a shipping container two months before, not really knowing what they were getting into, and then they fly to the U.S. to Rochester, New York, of all places, and we took the old Kodak factory and turned it into this amazing uh, playground. It's it's hard to imagine what it would be like for most people to think, oh, I'll just take my own pride and joy, my car that I love so much, and I'll go put it on this insane competition that's not some million-dollar sweepstakes or anything. Like, no, they went and beat up their own cars to show that they were the absolute best in the world. And to me, being there, being a part of it, I don't, I don't know if I've been a part of anything cooler. Doing Top Gear – um, us with adam and tanner is some of the greatest fun i've ever had in my life but this was different because i got to help showcase the talent that all these other people have and man it was just it was just so cool to see it and to see the ways that people would push e each other and themselves and to know now that families will sit and watch that show and my daughters all love it but to see families watch it and Husbands and wives come up and tell me, no, I'm a huge gearhead. She hates cars. She watched the whole thing with me. You know, we got through in one sitting. That's a really cool feeling, you know, because let's be honest. Sometimes the stuff that we do, Jim, it's great for guys like you and I, but there's no reason that any half of our friends would pay attention to it if they're not into that same love of the nut and bolt that we are. Yeah, well, and that's a true story, you know, and it's like every once in a while, like my wife will sit down and she'll watch an IndyCar race with me or – or, or something like that, you know, when, it, you know, or, or portions of the Indy 500, but, you know, by and large, she'll go away and be like, oh, this is kind of boring. And, you know, and even car shows and it, it's just the nuts and bolts of it. Like you said, like you've got to really be into it, but something like this, I know, and I, I watched, actually, I was reading something on it and somebody, it was one of the reviewers said, this is the show that we never knew needed to be made, but we're glad it was. And I, I think that kind of sums it up the best. You know, I don't think anybody knew the world needed this show, but now that it's here, it's like, oh man, it's got its hooks in us. Isn't that true? Like it's in, and I, to me, I sit there and think about if you were from Brazil and you were watching this show and you see two guys from your own country battle head to head on this amazing course, it gets harder and harder. How could you not want to go try it? And there is that chance that, we could do almost – you could do, like, regional qualifier-type things in the same sort of way that other motorsports have said, yeah, come out, try it, you know, see see how it feels, whatever. But we could do that same notion all over the world and, and to give people this great stage because we've had some incredible drivers on there. Fielding Shredder, uh, who's from Lone Star Drift out in Texas, um, ripped it up. Brittany Williams, Farouk Kawhi. There's been some amazingly talented people – um, that have been on there but I also love like there was this gal Sarah Harrow that shows up from Florida in what was her daily driver like two weeks before the show and she basically takes the interior out of her V6 Mustang <laughs> they weld a roll cage in and she goes out there and gives it hell and she had been doing some kind of smaller drifting in and around um, Florida but only for like the past eight months in part time. And dude, she got out there with the most heart I've ever seen and ripped it up. And that to me 
is what I love because don't get me wrong, I love watching the B.J. Baldwins and Casey Currys and Jim Beavers of the world. I do. I love to see people who have the talent and the sponsors and everything else to make it. But when you see somebody show up in their own car and go put it on the line and kick ass, it makes you just feel so good about all of motorsports in general. It really does. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and one thing that I've really, you know, I've I've tried to do through this show, but – and that seems like that show is the same way as I, I feel like women now, like, you know, in motorsport and in car culture, like they, they're very accepting. And I know at one point in time, it was almost like there's this barrier to entry where maybe there was some interest, but it was just like, you're not welcome. But I feel like literally in the, especially in the last decade, but I, I've seen the motorsports industry just, just open their arms wide to, to women. And I, I love seeing women come out and whether it be in a Jeep out on the rocks or in a UTV or, in, you know, in this case on your TV show, like I, I love the, fact that women are getting involved in some of them are great great phenomenal drivers and i think that that's one thing that we're that i love about the auto industry right now is that we have shifted you know that that paradigm and and now it's like you know women are completely equal with men and they have these opportunities to come in and show what they've got completely because and and that's you know what having three daughters and have them be able to sit there and watch and go, Oh, I really like Brittany or I think Sarah's going to take it. Like that stuff, you know, there's no other way to do that. And, you know, I think that's why so many of us took um, losing our friend, Jesse Combs so hard is because she wasn't just a person that inspired some people. She was a person that inspired everybody. And I think that's what a show like hyperdrive can do is because, yeah, maybe you don't own a Lamborghini and, and figure out how to get it sideways. But the guy Tokyo that came out from Kansas City in his, like, junkyard Nissan S13, that guy still ripped it up, and he put it all on the line, and there was a huge amount of respect to be given to the people who don't just talk about doing something but actually get out there and do it. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Well, you know, you got to switch gears here, though, because you'd mentioned a couple times Tanner and Adam and, you know, and Top Gear. And, uh, man, I, I got to say, you, you'd you been involved in, uh, you know, television and NASCAR and stuff like that. But, you know, I feel like once Top Gear U.S. hit, and, and even Tanner, for, for the most part, I mean, people knew him from racing. But I feel like that show and, and you, your three personalities, when that all came together, I feel like that just completely, you know, skyrocketed all your guys' careers. And, I mean, made you – you know, not that you weren't household names before, but really put you guys on the map. And I know, you know, I, I've you know, been friends with Tanner for a long time, and that thing kind of came to an end, and, and things happen the way they are. But there, there's there been fans, like, I've seen so much on social media. Do you guys talk at all? And it, I mean, is there ever a chance you guys even reboot this thing as, like, a, a YouTube series or something on Netflix? I mean, is that in the back of your guys' minds, Rutledge? Oh, man. it's You know what's funny? It's always on our minds. Do it, doing that show with those two. Um, and, you know, it, it was any show like that that it has ever existed is going to have some kind of growing pains. And I think that what the three of us did well together is when they interviewed all of us and, and said, what do you think is going to make this show succeed or fail? I was like, well, if you've got three people pretending to be the guys from the UK, this thing's going to fail and I don't want to be a part of it. And they're like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm not here to be a Clarkson or a Hammond or a May. I was like, I just, I'm just me. So if this works, I'm all in. And and I remember the first day that I met Tanner, I was like starstruck because here's this guy I've been watching for years, um, you know, through through Drift and Supercars Exposed and all this other stuff. And there were all these like big Hollywood dudes that were there. None of them knew who Tanner was and none of them knew who I was. Um, it was a really funny thing that happened. And then we met Adam and things just really clicked because we shot a bunch of stuff together before we ever shot a single show. But I think what was cool is that we didn't pretend to be you know, people that you needed to listen to, like we weren't trying to pretend to be anything other than three guys on these insane road trips. And that's why you should enjoy it. So what's cool is I think people got to like grow with us. And then, you know, by the end, we had done 72 shows over six and a half, almost seven years for something that was supposed to be at like a five year, 50 show max kind of deal and the only bummer is really like there's no easy way to get around it the three of us wanted to keep doing the show and history channel wanted to have more of it but bbc got so lost with the uk guys leaving and and they just they ultimately they've killed a brand um in a really sad way that so many of us um loved so i wish i could tell you that we were going to totally reboot top gear and um save it from the ashes but sometimes you got to be able to admit that like 
pride is what got those people in in trouble, and uh, and it's not going to help them get out of it unless they can shake that. So uh, I would love to go do something fun with Adam and Tanner, and it's always something that's that's on our minds. And I think we we've gotten close a couple times, but you have to also be smart enough to say like, no, th- we had an opportunity to do one thing, and it was going to be cool, but it was just a little too hokey and. I think we all know like the audience that grew with us loves us just being ourselves together. And I really believe in my heart that that opportunity is going to happen for us to be able to go do that again. Because none of us, to, to your point, we didn't understand what was going to happen. We had never done a show that had the global airing that the top year did. And I didn't, I honestly didn't know until I got to the Olympics in 2016 for NBC. And, you know, there's, a, there's like, um, I can't remember the guy's name from NBC that was like Mr. Olympics. He's there with 24-hour security, Bob Costas. Bob Costas had a security guy with him at all times because people were worried, like, what happens if he gets kidnapped and all this other stuff. Not a single person knew who Bob Costas was that wasn't on our crew or from America. Everywhere we went, Jim, everyone knew who I was, like way more than, than at the time in the U.S. it felt like. Because Top Gear aired twice a day in Brazil, and car culture is that <laughs> important to them. So Tanner would be going to a you know a rally in the middle of nowhere and flying through Sweden or somewhere else, and every time he would get there, a security guard or a police officer or whatever would stop and want to talk to him about Top Gear for 15 minutes. So I don't think any of us ever realized what was happening when we were doing it, which is probably a, a great thing, and we just knew we were – going to have the time of our lives with these guys that became like family to me. Like I still talk to those two all the time. Um, and, and I love them. I really do. Like they're two of the best friends that I never knew I was going to have in the world. So it's, it's been incredible. And, and when you can see uh, the, the ways of success and continued that, that the guys from the UK have had and, and other people who have done shows together and whether it's, you know, Chris Jacobs and, and, chip foods to an overhaul and like when you find a combination that works and people support it um, you got to be smart enough to keep doing things with those people when you have that chance so uh, I really hope and I think we're going to get that shot to go do something that's the right thing because you know you also we don't want to show up uh, doing something that like we can't pretend to go drag race cars together like we couldn't go show up to like street outlaws yeah and have it make any sense. So uh, we'll see. But I love those guys, and we talk about it all the time, for sure. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, like you'd said, it's funny, you know, because a lot of even reality TV nowadays, it's so overproduced, and I, even personalities, like, I, you know, you'll know somebody, and they'll go on a show, and I'm like, that's not really that person. And uh, I think right. the, the key thing with Top Gear is that let your guys' personality shine. They never directed you, hey, you need to act this way. You need to be this guy. You need to do this. You know, they, I think that's what made that a success. And you look at other shows that have done that. I even look at the stuff that, like, you and Dale Jr. do on NBC. And it's funny because I think fans are really getting to get to see, see the side of Dale Jr. now, you know, the, the real Dale Jr. And, uh, you know, and I think that's what's special about, you know, just the, the things that you guys have been able to do to, together. And I think fans really attach themselves to that. I think that's really a, a key piece of what made Top Gear Top Gear was the fact that it just let you guys be you. And you know what? I think what's happening in, like, I think retroactively people, there are a lot of people that are like, oh, Top Gear scripted and it's this, that. They was like, well, number one, we didn't have a single script. They never handed us anything to, to read. Um, now, I think people were confusing the notion of, like, it's definitely a show that's produced. Like, there was a reason, like, I love Roadkill, but there's a reason that Roadkill wasn't on TV for the longest time because that was a absolute natural arc of these two friends. It's David and Mike, and they're going to go do something stupid, and you're going to see what happens. There's a reason a show like that hasn't worked on TV previously because you've got to have stuff that keeps people interested in everything else. Now, I've watched almost all all the shows they've done, so uh, the difference is they were people that would have a plan. But like most of the time, they'd call us and say, hey, you got three grand. You need to go 150 miles an hour. What do you want? And I would get on Craigslist and just start sending <laughs> links because I'd be I'd be covering a race somewhere. Or, you know, Tanner would be in another country. Adam would be acting in New York, whatever it was. And then we show up, and they this is what happened. So what was cool is that I think people are having a better appreciation for man. We got a lot of stuff done on that show and did some really cool things. I think the people that if you weren't totally paying attention, you'd be like, no, I know I'll watch it. Like you're having fun, whatever. And now you look back and go, wow, you drove to the top of a glacier in Iceland and there 
it doesn't make any sense. And like we got up to the top, and the whole time they thought, all right, if this thing goes off, if this volcano with the glacier on top goes off, <laughs> you have uh, three hours to to get down before it, it's like mass chaos because it's also going to create a flood, of course, underneath. And I was like, three hours? It took two and a half days to get up here. What am I going to do with three hours? <laughs> Yeah. You know, like that, that, I look back at the stuff that we did is just ridiculous. But I love that people still watch, whether it's on YouTube or or Hulu or this far. Like that's a cool thing. But uh, those same people, because Tanner helped design a lot of the courses for Hyperdrive, and a lot of people, the number one reaction I got from people is the show is awesome. When are you going to do something with Adam and Tanner? So it, it warms my heart uh, to to see that. And of course, a lot of people saying, "When season two, I want to try out." That to me is rad. Because, like, uh, tell me, once you see it, I believe that you would want to get out there and, and give it a shot and rip it up. I know you'd do great. Yeah. No, I I, I think everybody does. That's that's what's great about it. It's one of those where it, people see that, and I think that's what's been key with uh, any motorsports is, is it's been a success. And is people see it and they go, "Hey, I, I I can go and do that too." And I think you know that that's the thing with Polaris Razor. You know, is it, it's it's welcoming to everybody. That's the thing with just about you know any of these motorsports that really i think drifting for one you know people know hey we can i can go and do that i can take my car and learn to drift you know and i think hyperdrive is one of those you know it's one of those rarities the anomalies where you know you and i watch a top fuel car and we know we can't do that but i watch hyperdrive and i go oh i can do that too and that's what brings people in by you know in the masses totally totally so uh i think that, that's what i think that's what makes it work yeah, exactly. So that being said, we are almost to the three segment time break here, buddy. Uh, what what do you got next? I know NASCAR. It is playoff time, my friend. Uh, you know, I know you got some filming and stuff. What's uh, what, what's coming up for you in the next couple of weeks? Well, uh, I'm working on uh, another show for uh, Netflix. And I'm not allowed to tell you what it is yet, but it'll be awesome. Um, hopefully, we get to hear some good news on Hyperdrive soon. And yeah, uh, NASCAR and NBC is heating up. We got our you know, the field set for our 16 um, people running for the championship. So now we just, we got 10 more races to see how all this stuff is going to shake out. But uh, I'm bummed, man. Jimmy Johnson didn't, didn't make it. I know that would have been awesome, but uh, I got a feeling we're going to see maybe Denny Hamlin. Uh, It's been an insane year for him. Maybe even Kyle Busch. I don't know who we're going to, gonna pick but it's gonna be an awesome year that's for sure yeah i gotta say is uh is a guy that uh, knows both of jimmy's brothers and how much work that uh, Jarrett put into uh getting his old uh, off-road truck back together i absolutely the entire off-road community was so stoked on jimmy johnson bringing back the old chevy lightning for uh theme for for darlington and the video he put out with the old how off-road cool truck was that dude uh, dude i I don't. I, I swear the entire off road industry was literally on cloud nine because of that. Like I don't. I know Jimmy's still friends with a lot of people in the industry. He hasn't been back in a while, and rightfully so. He's trying to become the greatest NASCAR driver of all time. Um, right. But dude, like that was so so rad. I mean, he gave me goosebumps because I grew up. My dad raced against Jimmy in class eight, and then to see him bring that truck back, it was like so rad. And Jarrett, man, he did such a ridiculous job. That that thing. You know, to to dig around and find period correct parts and to rebuild that truck the way they did, and we got to give credit to Ally Bank. The fact that they said no, totally, we make make it exactly like you had it. Because a lot of these companies get in there and they're like, yeah, let's do a throwback, and it doesn't look anything like what they're throwing back to. But you know, that truck without that truck, we would have never had Jimmy Johnson in NASCAR is the truth. So to me, it's not only a piece of off-road history, it's a piece of NASCAR history. And that's what I loved about seeing it there in Darlington was just the coolest thing ever. Yeah. And now I know everybody's already talking, oh, hopefully Jimmy takes it to the Nora Mexican 1000, you know, the vintage race and takes it down there so we can see him run that. And I got to think that's on on his radar at some point. So uh, we'll see. He's got to be. He's so cool, man. I know he'd do it. Yeah, I, dude, I'm sure he is. And like I said, I know he's he's still friends with a lot of people in the industry. And uh, I can tell you, we'd welcome him back with open arms anytime he wanted to come back. And um, I'm sure Robbie Gordon would uh, give him a little rub here and there, too. So <laughs> it'd be fun to have him back. <laughs> you know it. Yeah, Jimmy versus Robbie in the desert once again. Wouldn't that be a storyline, man? I'd be there. I'd, I'd be I'd be on the front row. Yeah, I think both of us would. Oh, man. Rutledge, dude, thank you for the taking the time for uh, episode number 400, buddy. I can promise you it won't be 400 episodes before we do it again, man. 
Amen. Hey, congratulations. Thanks for having me. So proud of you, man. Thanks for uh, for doing what you do. This is such a cool thing to be a part of, and uh, and you're a legend. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you, buddy, and I'm sure we'll see you out at that General Continental Tire uh, party at SEMA once again, right? Yes, I can't wait. See you there. Uh, always fun with Rutledge Wood. Uh, thank you guys for tuning into the show. Uh, you know, I know, uh, obviously, I am off to SEMA. I'll be checking out my social media at Jim Beaver 15. We'll give you all my schedule of appearances. We'll be dropping, uh, we're actually recording live a couple of shows that week right there from the SEMA show floor. So uh, I think you guys are going to enjoy those shows. And, you know, if you like my show, you're going to love the official Lakers podcast on Podcast One. Join Emmy Award winning sports reporter Susie Schuster and uh, co host Aaron LaSalle Sewell as they discuss the Lakers news of the day, break down the game from the week and have exclusive interviews from players, coaches, and sports personalities. Don't miss the official Lakers podcast every week right here on Podcast One or wherever you get your favorite podcast. And once again, if you enjoyed Project Action, hit us up on iTunes, hit that subscribe button, leave a rating review, and uh, once again, follow me on social media. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm heading off to the SEMA show. I got a lot of stuff cranking, but uh, keep along with the fun, uh, you know, on social media with me. And don't forget to uh, support betonline.ag. Use that promo code podcast one as well as uh, check out geico.com to spend or to save yourself 15% or more on car insurance. All right. See you guys next week. Have a great one.